Section 13 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lillian Elizabeth. Monologues by Richard Middleton. On Dreams. Some time ago, I wrote an article in which I ventured to suggest that within certain limits we can make our dreams what we will, and that a considerable aesthetic pleasure may be derived from regarding this world of tables and chairs that surrounds us as illusory, the dream world to which we win at nights as passionately real. It is no part of my intention to disinter that article from the Cemetery of Forgotten Fancies though I think it was truer than most journalism. For I realize that since then we have all lived through a short period of wakeful life and possibly many centuries of dreams and are therefore, or so our quenchless optimism would assure us, so much the wiser. Our feet have trodden the pavements of starry palaces then unbuilt and the walls of strange night-hung cities have echoed to our new-made songs. In the year 1908, we were children. In the year 1910, we shall be old men. Today, we dream. Poets, who are the most interesting of the moving objects that inhabit the daylight world, win their curious supremacy in that world, a supremacy always disputed and always beyond dispute, by means of their imperial possessions in the world of sleep. And it is their recollection of their kingdoms under the moon that enables them to give color and beauty a form to the gray world that holds our disillusioned lives. But though we cannot hope to share, save at second hand, their intense recollection of the beautiful life of sleep, we are all able to remember it to a certain extent. And we use this partial recollection, wisely enough perhaps, not to make us discontented with our wakeful life, but to credit that life with qualities which it does not possess. I doubt very much whether many people realize how far their normal lives are affected by their dreams, yet it is in dreams that all desires are born. The popular phrase, as empty as a dream, is a very good example of the fairly general maxim. That to be successful a phrase must convey a definite untruth. Dreams are not empty. Indeed, I can conceive no human experience that less deserves that contemptuous adjective, for sometimes in a night of dreaming we live a hundred lives. Nevertheless, the popular contempt for the dreamer, the man who allows his love for the beauties of the sleep world to dull his realization of the ugly facts that constitute life, is founded on something more than a misleading phrase. Deep down in the heart of every man, you will find the instinctive conviction that life, despite the generous praises of the dying, is a monotonous task that it is very noble of us to perform. From this it is but a step to the assumption that enjoyment is somehow immoral, a belief silently held by nearly everyone, and not least by the pleasure-seekers themselves, and that happy people are evading their duties. It is this intense belief in the divinity of our secret discontents that is called joie de vivre. Now looking round the world, I can find no man more happy, and therefore I suppose no man more wicked, than your successful dreamer. He is the eloquent exception to the rule, that is in the gratification of desire lies misery for his desires have only to be conceived to be gratified, and for him achievement brings no sorrow. There is so great a variety of life in the world of dreams that satiety is impossible. Your practiced dreamer rather finds it difficult to linger in enjoyment of his perfected conceptions, so wide a world lies ready for his adventurous feet. Nor does the reproachful attitude of patiently suffering humanity encourage him to leave his dreaming and take up his duty of life. No rich man, stricken bankrupt, is as poor as a dream magnet in his rare moments of life consciousness. 
In place of his palaces, he finds villas of mud. In place of his laughing kingdom, he finds a disillusioned world. In place of his generous courtiers, he finds a people patently mistrustful of him, and even harder to bear, secretly mistrustful of themselves. It is not to be wondered that the habit grows with age, so that the boy who can lay aside his dreams with his marbles becomes the man who can hardly recognize the fading shapes of the concrete world. And when we have finished laughing at a man because he will not leave his gardens of far and dreamy roses to brush his hair, perhaps we may admit that there is a note of envy in our mocking criticism of his unkempt hair. There is, to snatch the obvious pun, a sorrow not wholly sweet in our partings. Without in the least wishing to insult or even ignore convention, we know that we lack the power. If by some strange mischance our locks were shaggy and untrimmed, two bars of a familiar tune whistled on the lips of a street boy would suffice to send us cringing to the barber. Every normal individual believes that he can only hide the weakness of his coward soul by imitating his neighbor in, in essentials. And the result of this mutual mimicking is a mournful uniformity in the hideousness of our appearance. When we laugh at a man for looking at a gollywog, we are trying to defend our own neglect of beauty. We do not look like gollywogs, but we do look like each other, and reason should tell us that that is worse. Of course, it may be said that a dreamer does not ignore convention because he disapproves of it, but because he is not conscious of it. And this is true. But whether you prefer to call his rapt absence of mind weakness or strength, it must be acknowledged that it helps him to overcome a number of difficulties, the mere possibility of which is enough to keep us timorously miserable. Poverty, which might be called the daymare of humanity, only sends him more passionately to his dreaming, and it is thus with all the misfortunes of which the image holds us wretchedly wakeful. We would all like to conquer our fears, and the dreamer succeeds with a flicker of the eyelids and an inward glance at his heaped treasury. If dreaming be a weakness, as those aver who have consciences like alarm clocks, it seems better able to conquer the facts of existence than our strength. Yet if we are not dreamers, we have our dreams. If we have not the ropes of stars and purses of silver moons and golden suns of the poets, we have not wholly valueless bric-a-brac of our own. Clear-cut moments of sleep-like fragments of medieval carving, faces twisted with streaky clay by Japanese fingers, wet pebbles that have caught the sun on a rainy day, pine trees and smooth hills and burning fields of gorse, tinted tatters from the rag bag of our consciousness. These things add a touch of enchantment to our most sober nights of sleep and sometimes set us astride behind the witches to see a mad world from the back of a broomstick and flout the law of gravity. After a night spent like this, it is a little absurd to damn Lord Northcliffe, fate and the government because the train is two minutes late, or an egg is overcooked. Yet the man who can build castles of moonbeams and twist ropes from sand in pajamas becomes a foolish and petulant child when he puts on the uniform of his kind. It is possible that his folly represents an honest effort to express his share of our common humanity, but it is folly nevertheless. I never meet a nice, clean city gentleman without wishing that he had brought his broomstick with him. Without it, he is merely a careful example of a colorless and uninteresting type. It is, I believe, bad form in the city to be individual, but it is bad art to be an unimaginative reproduction of the conventional conception of civilized man. My mind prefers even the gollywogs and teddy bears of humanity to these soulless picture postcards. No doubt is it pleasant to criticize the Daily Mail and the government, but to damn one's neighbor and cultivate one's individuality 
is a more hopeful task. But most people only do this in dreams, and as they die every morning when they wake up, we never see anything but their corpses. My moral is that most of us live only in dreams, because when we are awake, we are not brave enough to face the task of living our unaided individualities. If we all part our hair in the middle and wear the same silly clothes and feign interest in the same silly things, perhaps the devil will not know us apart. That, I suppose, would be the medieval interpretation of our motive. Substituting our own consciences for the devil, it stands pretty well today. But the dreamer, the man our every institution seems designed to punish, he also lives only in dreams and only differs from us in that he lives 24 hours for our 8 or 10. If, in place of his daylight dreaming, we achieved a splendidly passionate manner of life, our reproaches might be justified. But we should not blame him if he finds our petty puppet show undignified, and our timorous art of mutual mimicry unworthy of his attention. End of section 13 Recording by Lillian Elizabeth. Section 14 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellery Davidson. Monologues by Richard Middleton. New Year's Eve. When that I was and a little tiny boy, I admit that I have stolen this way of beginning an article from Mr. Quiller Couch, there was always something very precious to me in the simple ceremony of letting in the new year and letting out the old. Doubtless the unwanted thrill of sitting up late and sipping hot lemonade, which we children called punch, had something to do with the deep-breathed solemnity with which the occasion inspired me. But even now, when I am tired of sitting up late, and even more tired of punch, and, above all, when I have realized that the years grow worse instead of better, even now I cannot hear the clock strike twelve at midnight of the 31st of December without a quickening of the pulse, for which my reason can supply no satisfactory explanation. I repeat that I have got beyond the folly of expecting the new year to be any better than the old. Indeed, the present year has given me every satisfaction, and I should probably be wiser to spend the rest of my days in the year 1909 than to fare further into the unknown. But we poor two-footed beasts have such an itch for traveling that I do not doubt that I will let in the new year at the earliest possible moment and kick my good friend 1909 ungratefully from my door. The new year may prove the scurviest of fellows, yet, mad optimists as we are, we will all be there waiting for him before he is due to arrive. He will help to rob us of our brains, our teeth, and our hair. He will continue that process of decay that brings us at last to our tardy graves. He will put some of us in love and some of us in prison, but his first amusement will be most mischievous of all for he will hardly be five minutes old before he sets us cheating ourselves into the belief that we are about to become very fine fellows. Everyone goes to bed on New Year's Eve with his hands smeared with tar from his paving operations on the road to hell. It is so easy to make good resolutions while the bells are chiming their welcome all over the midnight sky, but it is still easier to feel foolish in the morning. It may be questioned whether there is not an element of danger in this violent forming of impossible resolutions. A debauch of virtuous feeling overnight is apt to induce a kind of moral hot coppers in the morning, and the sudden realization of the hopeless nature of their good resolutions may lead people to accept their own failings a little too readily. There is a good deal of difference between the position of the man who says, I am wicked, and that of the man who says, I wish I were not wicked. In truth, it is just as well not to have too clear a sense of how far we fall short of our own standards of morality, or we may start degrading our standard to fit our own case. 
when a man has solemnly formed a resolution and failed to keep it he has done an injury to his will it is better to improve than to form good resolutions these are truisms but the truism is a wild fowl very seasonable at this time of the year it is generally admitted that the resolutions made on new year's eve are difficult or impossible to keep and we have seen that this failure is bad for character what then i can conceive the conscientious reader asking what then am i to do next friday when the bells are tolling out the old year and i am feeling solemn and uplifted really the question is a little difficult to answer it might not be a bad plan to make a few good resolutions on behalf of other people to resolve for instance that mr bernard shaw should write no more to the times that miss corelli of stratford should hold her peace about matters that do not concern her work that the laureate should rhyme no more that the mr rudyard kipling of the jungle books should return to us that writers in general should believe in their own art and that the whole school of moral critics should rush down a steep place into the sea personally i should wake up when i came to that last resolution it would strain even the optimism born of new year's eve to believe in the possibility of anything so desirable as that seriously there is something in the wind on new year's eve that affects most of us strangely at no other time are we so much disposed to regard life as rather more than a series of haphazard moments the years take ordered shape behind us and while we regard them dispassionately we have the sense of other years no less ordered that wait our coming the arbitrary division of our calendar assumes an almost spiritual significance we can feel ourselves changing as the moments fall gently through the hands of destiny and we return to our homes after the stroke of twelve not one year but many years older it is as though in that moment of intense consciousness we are permitted to catch a glimpse of the world that lies outside us our senses are abnormally keen we can feel the breath of the bumping hours we can hear the pulse of the world's heart almost it seems that our minds can detect the purpose of our strange bewildered lives dim uncertain incomprehensible but yet endowing them with a new dignity a new resolve after we creep back to our hearths a little cold with rebellious voices our hearts struggling vainly against disillusionment irritating trifles swarm into our minds and blot out our sense of the infinite it is time the children were in bed christine has obviously caught a cold we must remember to put 1910 at the head of our letters. The dream is over. So far, I have been content to consider the case of those who observe the coming of the new year with proper ritual, but there are others. For my part, I think that the man who lightly misses an opportunity of resting for an instant from the whirl and babble of our breathless lives is much to be pitied, and, therefore, I patronize with my sympathy all those lost creatures who snore the new year in in bed and shout it in in restaurants i have welcomed it in many places but like christmas it comes perhaps with the best grace in the country nevertheless one of the most impressive new year's eves i remember was spent on the balcony of a london flat when the year came swaggering in with such a jangling of bells that the fine lady of banbury cross was nothing to him after all the spirit is always more important than the environment the great thing is to stop for a moment and look one's life in the face nor after all is it such a bad thing to regard the future hopefully it will not do the future any good but nothing can deprive us of the thrill proper to the optimist let us by all means greet the unseen with a cheer and a word in passing for the year that is gone to come again no more what days it has given us what golden magic days it is true that only a minute fraction of it remains with us but that fraction is the best of all the pride of sunny fields the gleam of a girl's face wet with autumn rain the lonely star we found in a hollow of the sussex hills the fragment of song that came to us on exmoor how good these things were how good they are even now 
i can sit in my chair on the brink of 1910 and think of a hundred moments in 1909 to set my heart beating with excitement and make my body radiant with joy of life and so can every one of my readers if they have a mind to believe if you wish that the pains of life outnumber the pleasures but bear in mind that it is your own fault if you keep the evil and forget the good if i could thread the stars like beads i should make a necklace of them for my good fairy nineteen o nine and i should give him the sun and moon for playthings welcome the new year as you will but do not neglect to drop a tear of gratitude for the old what golden magic days what enchanted nights of stars it really is a little hard to believe that the new year will bring us anything as good end of section fourteen Section 15 of Monologues Why Women Fail in Art In these exciting days, when women are no longer the frail, the timorous creatures beloved, and shall we whisper patronized, by our robust ancestors, it may be unwise to consider such a problem as is conveyed in the title of my article, without giving at the start a definite assurance as to my appreciation of the thousand qualities of the charming sex. Personally, I confess that the spirited movement of the suffragettes leaves me a little cold, but not because I think that women ought not to have votes, but because I cannot conceive that any sane person can want a vote or find it of any use if he has it. After all, the methods employed by the militant suffragettes are their own affair. For my part, I am afraid of hatpins but I have found the bright eyes of girls more deadly. I mistrust dog-whips, but the domestic eloquence of women fills me with a greater dismay. The anger of women is terrifying, but their tears consume me utterly. I should believe in votes for women, or even in votes for women, if I believed in votes at all. And now I hope after this preliminary explanation, there is no risk of my being waylaid by militant vote-seekers with a taste for letters. The argument that because women have not shown in the world of art they do not deserve a vote is foolish, because there is nothing in the life of the artist to fit him specially for the task of interfering in the misgovernment of his country. Indeed, I suppose brains are not part of the artist's birthright, and they are a serious drawback in a politician, as Mr. Belfort's admirers have found. So? dear ladies the very extent of your failure in art may be the measure of your capacity as politicians is that not a pretty speech there is one other kind of critic with whom i should like to deal before i take up my argument and that is the impulsive person who will read the title of my article and promptly sent me a queer list of names ranging from sappho to gibb from christina rossetti to mrs hemans from Vijay Lebrun to Cade Greenaway. Now, it is true that until comparatively recent times, it may have been difficult for women to achieve distinction as painters for lack of opportunity and training, but there has been nothing to prevent them from displaying their merit as writers if they had it. They've had free access to pen and ink and paper, and on the whole they have a great deal more leisure than men in which to cultivate the most agreeable of arts. Yet, Although at times critics have erred in generosity in estimating the value of the work of women writers, it will be easier to prepare a list of a thousand men than to give one fifty women who could be said to have produced work of definite artistic value. Why is this? Why is it that women who can do what they like in the normal world of life should accomplish so little in the world of art? I suppose that once upon a time it would have been sufficient to mention their family duties, and pass on serenely satisfied with the explanation. But the present-day opinion of women demands subtire reasons. I would suggest two. In the first place, the motive force that drives all artists is the desire for self-expression, and I doubt whether in this sense of the word women have any self to express. Secondly, women regard life itself as a conscious art, and the pertinacity and intensity with which they develop this idea leaves them little energy 
or creative work they might almost be said to exhaust their creative energies in seeking to invent themselves it will be seen that my two reasons overlap so it will be convenient to consider them together and here i must say a word about the classic perils of generalizing on women it is always dangerous to generalize about anything but i think it may fairly be said that it is easier to treat of women in the aggregate than to form any general conceptions of the character of men women are far more womanly than men are manly and this is the heart of my first reason women always strike me as being rather representative fragments of their sex than independent human beings in a state of individual existence in this connection it is interesting to contrast children of either sex boys have certain strongly marked characteristics of their own but they do not bear more resemblance to men than puppies do to adult dogs girls on the other hand so far as they have any character at all are women in miniature and as like their elder sisters as kittens are to cats i've seen a girl baby six months old practicing the art of producing smiles of calculated sweetness in her prattle while her brother two years older was still content with the rapt unconscious grin of innocent childhood it is curious that while the word boy still stands for pleasant youthfulness we have to qualify the word girl with the epithet little to grant it a similar grace it may perhaps seem a hard saying that women do not exist at all but at least i may venture that only in very exceptional cases can they claim an individual character i do not know who first traced the resemblance between a woman and a mirror but whoever it may have been he had won more than an idle fancy from his reflections men are born with the germs of character which they develop in passing from youth to maturity women are born with violent instincts but with no character that they can call their own and they spent their lifetime endeavoring to acquire one whatever they admire they steal women said wild are sphinxes without secrets but he did not give them sufficient credit for their skill in the construction of sphinxes we simple-minded men may well lament over the subtlety of women when in all her wakeful life she has labored day by day and year by year on that delightful work of art herself her smiles her tears her moments of forgetfulness all have their significance and represent hours of patient toil her failures are pitiful but her triumphs are beyond those of any ordinary artist in her highest forms her air of the unconscious that conceals art is perfect she affects the simplicity of a child the courage of a man the fervor of a prophet and the wisdom of solomon and over all she flings the cloak of mystery that envelops the lives of those who hold high dreams free herself from the doubts that shadow the intellectual she secretly despises men because they are not clever enough to give the credit of her work to her and not to nature sometimes indeed she feels the longing of the artist for recognition and lifts the curtain though it be but a little to the man she loves only to let it fall aghast when she realizes that it is her handiwork that men love and not herself Perhaps in her wakeful nights she wearies of her lifelong task, and mourns for the simplicity that is not hers. But Dawn finds her smiling, alert, certain of herself, ready to add a new touch of color, a new phrase, to the work that she follows dauntlessly to the very gates of death. Looking at the pages of literary history, I am, on the whole, surprised that women have accomplished as much in pure art as they have for at best a woman's work is never more than a secondary occupation in her life and we have seen that her labor in her sweet task of self-creation must be terribly exhausting no writer or painter devotes a tenth part of the time to his work that a woman spends in carrying on the charmed traditions of her sex and even if we endow a woman with extraordinary powers of expression we must remember that she will have little save echoes to express she has formed an enchanted human shape from impressions of a thousand models but beyond these skilful derivations she has nothing 
but the normal instincts of her sex, which nature is over-eager to express for her. If the natural woman survive beyond the mask, she will express herself in children. These are her sonnets and her love stories, her nocturnes and her autobiography. If the natural woman has perished beneath the paint, and I suspect that the death rate amongst natural women is rapidly increasing, she will fling herself the more passionately into her task of creating the vision that decks the lives of men with the glory they call love. Why should women write books when they can bear children? Why should women paint pictures when they can make themselves? Their work has inspired all that is best in the art of man. Art lyric poems are but timid reproductions of their conceptions. They make by day the dreams that we win by the light of the stars. It is possible that some of them reading this page will hardly feel flattered by this perfectly sincere appreciation of their skill in creating their own charm. I do not know why they should be displeased. I would point out, however, that my article negates its title, for I have endeavored to suggest that women are the greatest and most successful artists of all. It is only by the light of woman, this supreme invention of women, that men come to a sense of their own imperfections. We worship them from afar, even if they lie in our hearts. And it is for love of women as women have made them that men succeed in art. End of section 15section sixteen of monologues this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org monologues by richard middleton an election tide dream as a lax student of many newspapers it seems to me that a great deal too much has been written about general elections and that this is the moment when the truly great talk about something else. I do not say that the journalists are wrong. English people seem to be very fond of elections. They would not celebrate the apotheosis of poor old Guy Fawkes year after year if they were not, but I doubt whether they are quite so fond of them as the future student of our contemporary press might imagine. The men who can cheer lustily when they see for the thousandth time the features of Mr. Chamberlain or Mr. Lloyd George flung on a screen are few and far between. We others, whose political enthusiasms are less godlike, may well plead election headache after several days of strident democracy and aristocratic hubbub. And, fortunately, for the average patriot whose lungs and ears and degree of patience are only normal, there are more leisurely joys than those of a general election. There are quieter kingdoms than the fierce world of party politics. It is possible to steal away from the argument, about it and about, to some pleasant field of dreams where it is no crime to lie and take one's rest, and where the heart may whisper without treason, What does it matter? I remember reading a long time ago, was it not in the fragrant pages of the yellow book, a delightful article by Mr. Max Beerbaum on the seaside in winter. I cannot recall a word of it. Hardly an idea, but an hour back, the cold wind blowing in from the sea restored to me the whole atmosphere of it. And after all, in essays, it is the atmosphere that counts. The receding tide hushed softly to me in the winter twilight. The ribbed sand greeted my grateful feet through the soles of my town-going boots. Behind me, the cliffs climbed vaguely to heaven, showing here and there a glimmering light to remind me that I dwell in a civilized world. It was a solemn moment, one of those moments in which the individual feels at once modest and important, modest in his share of life and important in his relationship to it. And in that solemn moment, there came to me two impressions. One, as I have said, was that of having read an essay by Mr. Beerbaum a long time ago. The other touched on the ridiculous. When seawater dries on brown boots, it leaves a white deposit of salt. I was not wearing brown boots, but nevertheless I recall the appearance of that deposit. For most of our days, our lives seem as meaningless as that. Had I rested content with the peace of the dusk and my two impressions and gone home, 
my mind i suppose would have dismissed the occasion as uneventful and this article would have remained unwritten instead i gave a little shivering criticism of the thickness of my overcoat and walked briskly along the shore to a place where the rocks thrust rugged heads through the level sand a place where there were pools and seaweed and a salty smell there is something about seaweed that takes me by the throat something nevertheless that i cannot express for myself in words some day i fancy a writer will explain my emotion to me in an epithet or in a line and half a verse but as yet i have not found the revealing phrase it is so cold and so dead and at the same time so tenderly fragile it lies on the shore in haphazard bunches and tresses and you have to look at it carefully before you realize the beauty of these poor dead flowers of the sea men and women trample them underfoot unheeding but children who see the beauty better than we love them and heap them high in their little pails it may be some forgotten fairy story that links seaweed in my mind with the hair of a beautiful woman drowned while she was still young or perhaps ariel gave me the image in a dream but there where the rocks were and the seaweed with its strange salt smell of the sea i saw a ghost a ghost that i thought i had laid forever i will not set down her name here not out of respect for the dead for she is not dead nor out of sentimental regard for my feelings for i have learnt to forget her but because if she happened to read these lines she had rather that i did not in any case i must beware of the crime of richard le gallienne and sentimental tommy the crime of making copy out of emotions which we ought to have experienced but have not for my ghost was a girl whom i once thought to love in the hot pride of my youth and whom i meet no more this is not i suppose the place for a philosophical dissertation on the nature of love in general or i would make some judicious reflections on this case in particular say that i loved a girl who was willing to accept my friendship the modern equivalent of the i'll be a sister to you of our shrewd grandmothers say that some strange things happened some humorous and some perhaps not unsympathetic and you will have done justice to the situation speaking dispassionately i should say that the really wise youth will always accept a girl's friendship in return for his love but are there any real wise young men it will be seen that fate had played an odd trick on me in sending such a ghost to charm the wintry shore but while my pulse quickened and my heart beat louder i was far from blaming that austere lady for her choice of a messenger yet in spite of my excitation of spirit my senses took note of the curious phenomena that are the natural order of things in the world of apparitions the night glowed into day the winter warmed into summer and from the vague shadows there sprang blue sea and sky yellow sands and green capped cliffs of white i say that i noticed this change but it did not astonish me a jot nor was i surprised to find that in her metamorphosis from flesh and blood to a creature of dreams my love had remained unaltered she could hardly grow more pretty and why should anyone be less beautiful in a dream than in real life my aesthetic sense went out to do her homage i always mistrust a man who can give a lyrical but accurate description of the girl he loves true passion is never eloquent it stumbles vainly through the shadows of speech in search of some illuminating and tremendous word i can give no logical description of the appearance of my ghost she had dark hair and a nice shaped face and there was something about her eyes but i have noticed that there nearly always is something about their eyes she was sitting on a rock in the sun and her feet were bare and shining wet from the sea observe how dreams improve on life as a matter of fact in all the long months of my passion i had never seen her feet yet now that their silver pink shapeliness was revealed to me in my vision i found them very well worth looking at there is something charmingly intimate about a girl's toes as i drew near her ghost raised her head and said no i cannot tell you in truth the dialogue that seemed so gracious and sagely witty in the light of a dream turns to the merest dust of words at the touch of my wakeful pen as with the seaweed and the face of my ghost the decisive word eludes me that would enable me to give form to her message and in the vain search for it my fancy totters to its foundation 
and I know that I have built my Spanish castle on the sands of doubt. No, I have not been down to the sea this winter. I have passed the long days in the city distraught between meaningless rumors and idiotic passions. As I write, a hoarse cheering breaks from the street and rattles upon the window panes. The success of some creature of ignoble ambition has pleased the vanity of the mob that has helped to raise him an infinitely small degree above its own level. All over the country the news will fly of another victory for an army that does not exist, in a campaign that does not matter, and other mobs will offend the air of heaven with their impertinent breath. The successful creature will strut for a while, flattered, envied, and abused by those who have given him his barren honors, and then he will pass and be no more. There will come other fools to take his place. What though the dreams leave a bitter taste on the lips of the awakened dreamer? He can fall to dreaming again, and forget the sorrow of his shattered visions, and sooner or later, perhaps, he will find that all his haphazard wanderings in the sleep-lit world have had a definite and assured aim, that all unconsciously he has been drawing nearer to the goal of his desires. Are the elections more real, more permanent, more significant than the dream you won last night? Where the sea that broke at the feet of my ghost and me an hour ago. Where the heart is, there the treasure is also. By all means, choose the substance and abjure the shadow. But who shall say that the dream is not the shadow? The life that surrounds us, the terrible shadow of our desolate hearts. End of section 16. Recorded by Bob Hamilton. Section 17 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monologues by Richard Middleton. The New Sex. I do not wish to weary the readers with yet another article on whether women should or should not have votes. In itself, the problem is of very small importance, as most men and women realize that it is not votes but opinions that govern a country. But the cause, as I believe the elect call it, becomes significant when it is considered, not as an isolated battle, but as a relatively unimportant skirmish in an enormously important campaign. This is the campaign that began with the conspiracy of Eve against Adam, and has developed in course of time into what is known as the sex war, the eternal conflict between man and woman. We are told that in its initial stage that the devil was on the side of the woman in this campaign, and cynics of the male sex would have us believe that this is still the case. I would prefer to think that, like the immortal Dr. Bultitude, the devil is prepared to score for either side, and that he does not fail to reap the reward for this impartiality. Both sides, impelled by the purest motives, forswear the aid of their dusky auxiliary, but the devil is not notably discouraged by their ingratitude. In fact, nothing is more surprising to the thoughtful than the way in which the devil continues to flourish in the face of universal reprobation. And there are not wanting philosophers to suggest that he is not only responsible for our immoralities, but all our conventional moralities as well. Certainly they do him no disservice. It is not my purpose to write about the devil, otherwise than indirectly. But the difficulty of writing about questions of sex in the English language for English readers is that it is absolutely necessary to display a wholly indecent reticence. The only dissertation on sex that is really tolerated in England is the unrecorded badinage of our smoking rooms, the modern equivalent of the folk tales and folk songs of our uncultured ancestors. And the mind shrinks from the task of translating a serious consideration of sex questions into azure anecdotes and libidinous limericks. I had rather be indecently reticent than outspoken on those terms. Before we come to consider the circumstances that have brought about the latest phase of revolt of a certain section of women against men, it is necessary to recall the nature of the truths that had been more or less observed by both sexes before the recent upheaval of militant femininity. The truce took a form of a compromise, and a very ingenious and successful compromise at that. Men were to be nominally, and women wholly, 
monogamous in exchange for the privilege of possessing one woman wholly a man was expected to provide for her and their joint offspring it was tacitly understood that men were intellectual capable courageous and masterful and that women were simple faithful and possessed of a thousand charms neither party to the compact was supposed to depart from these natural qualities men were not to be emotional and women were not to think looking back we can realize now that as far as they went they were golden days regarding the future we can feel no such blissful certainty of course the compromise failed in individual instances but on the whole it worked very well and it is not these failures that we must trace the new feminist movement it is due probably to two causes first to the greater measure of education that is now granted to women and second to the economic fact that a large number of women can now earn their own living without the laws of liberty or self-respect the first is the vaguer but probably the more cogent reason for while our modern system of education has produced no noticeable change either for the better or the worse in our young men it has certainly had a remarkable effect on our young women they have taken with beginner's eagerness to the engrossing pastime of thinking and in consequence they show an increasing desire to break the great truce between the sexes and the second reason that i gave above supplies them with the opportunity there has always been a considerable number of women who did not desire marriage in itself but who nevertheless were forced to marry in order to obtain a home and someone to support them nowadays these women can obtain a situation as a clerk or typist and deride the efforts of clever strong masterful men to take the queenly citadel by storm these newly enfranchised women are rarely sufficiently sure of themselves to ignore man as they feel he ought to be ignored they are rude to him in the mass in order to counteract a despicable secret desire to appoint some individual manifestation of him their master they throw away one effective weapon of their sex of their own free will but they are not prepared to face the reluctant loss of their battles with philosophic calm they disdain the idea of charming men but are dismayed when they find that men are not charmed behind the most ferocious suffragette there still lurks a woman with one eye on the world and one on her mirror and therefore she cannot see to fight it is for this reason that men have been able to so far treat the whole problem of the suffragettes with tolerant good humor but the man dwells in a fool's paradise and not a bad place in which to dwell either who does not realize that behind this insignificant demand for votes lies hidden the germs of a struggle of a far more desperate character it must be remembered that the standard of feminine education is steadily rising and more women are becoming self-supporting every year now the whole tendency of modern education is to arouse in the individual that curious form of discontent known as ambition without providing him or her with any efficient means of satisfying it in man this hopeful helpless state of mind is almost normal but for woman it has the fatal attraction of novelty for countless generations she had been content with waging the placid warfare of home life and its little victories and little defeats have composed the history of her days but now as it were in a dream she sees the world that man has conquered opening to her feet and the dream being new she does not realize the boundaries of the world are no wider than the boundaries of the kingdom she has ruled hitherto and she longs to change the substance for the shadow revolting against the divine purpose of her motherhood she covets the unreal splendor of the purposeless lives of men why should she she asks with her hands and her eyes and her brain be no more than a mother and a nurse for babies she does not stay to consider that man's part in the universe is even smaller than this she wishes to sacrifice the ennobling privileges of her sex for the glamour with which men hide the weary emptiness of their days and circumstance is helping her to do it the revolt of women against motherhood is no new thing but whereas in bygone years we have been accustomed to regard it as an eccentricity i am not sure that in the future we may not find it a very serious factor in our national life i believe that among the english middle classes the birth rate is already abnormally low and when as seems likely to happen sooner or later 
the whole of our population joins the middle class the effect of the new feminine ambitions will certainly be very serious i am aware that so far from attacking motherhood the actual suffragettes of today find it one of the most useful weapons in their oratorical armory but the fact remains that they themselves the pioneers of the movement that is to work wonders for their sex have done very little to supply the incessant demand of the state for babies and it is difficult not to conclude that the tendency is for the intelligent woman of the day to examine the problem and find that it is not worth her while to be a mother the only drawback of this decision is that it renders her absolutely useless and even wasteful to the country that gives her shelter she eats food and burns coal but so far as human progress or the prosperity of the state is concerned she might as well not be there at all we human creatures may humbug ourselves as we will but the first law of existence is that we must continue the race for women breeding and raising of children have proved sufficient to completely occupy the efficient section of their lives the duties that men inherit are smaller and they have found it necessary to invent politics art science justice education and a thousand other toys to while away the idle hours to help them to conceal their relative unimportance from the female sex hitherto we have most of us imagined that women could see through the hollow pretense of our lives and it comes as a shock to discover that there are women and clever women at that capable of envying us our possessions of gaudy painted wings that glisten in the sunlight prettily enough but will not help us to fly heaven knows we are some of us weary enough of this load of petty shams that women of to-day seem to covet we have to live out our days and we may as well make the best of them but surely it is permissible to remark that they do these things better in beehives i have ventured to call my article the new sex and looking ahead it is not unreasonable to see women drifting into two strongly divided camps the one intellectual energetic independent and supremely useless the other emotional affectionate placid and in all things motherly the weakness of the former camp will be its sterility though doubtless every generation will send its tithe of recruits the strength of the latter camp will be its permanence with the intellectual women men will fight as they fight with each other on terms of miserable equality to the emotional women they will go as they go now to justify their existence and to meet their fate the woman who wishes she had been born a man is a fool End of section 17。section 18 of monologues。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox dot org。monologues by richard middleton。on editors。in spite of their lack of faith。the present generation is but little tolerant of those who make it their business to reveal and thereby to destroy the heart of the great mysteries perhaps it is that though we do not believe anything in particular we do not wish to accept the necessary responsibilities of our sceptical attitude towards things in general like the mythical but ubiquitous ostrich we had rather whale our eyes with the sands of doubt which is half-sister to faith than acknowledge the wholly inimicable character of the shadows that haunt the desert in which we live we do not believe but we are unwilling to be told that we do not believe and of our fear we create a virtue of broad-mindedness of all the concrete mysteries none is more loyally and watchfully guarded than the mystery of the editor dimly like a dream seen from the heart of a dream we are permitted to perceive that there is a force a power a cause that induces multitudinous and widely scattered effects we conceive him as being essentially superhuman a subtle judge of right and wrong a dreamer of gigantic dreams whose messages to us have an emphasis of an inspired command to all ordinary men and women he remains invisible it is enough to have met the sub-editor who has touched the great man's hand an office-boy who has filled his ink-pot not that we would wish to see him if we had the power for his infallibility would scourge us for a hundred mental weaknesses even his thoughts we feel are correctly punctuated 
It is not without a just sense of the value of mysteries that I hazard the assertion that editors are not really like this. It is not passing the bounds of a decent reticence to remark that by daylight they vary a little, but nevertheless, in all essentials, resemble the ordinary man. If I had to form an impressionist sketch of my vague recollections of the type, I think I should draw a timid, hesitant man, very well informed on one or two subjects, but with a vast ignorance of the traditional judge on things in general. I should represent him as peeping gratefully at a catalogue of spring bulbs in the intervals of directing the affairs of the empire. Honest, kindly, conscientiously anxious to reconcile the dim remnants of his youthful aesthetism with his duty towards his directors, his advertisement manager, and his family, utterly out of touch with the literature of his day, but with a jealous admiration for Milton, Dr. Johnson, and Thackeray, and a very great contentment for the frivolous graces of the modern prose. A man, as I have said, essentially timid, who would be reduced to dust in a day if he were not handsomely guarded by an army of cynical sub-editors and translucent office boys. Some such shape my fancy portrait would assume. But this is a fancy portrait, as far from the truth, perhaps, as the imagined editor of a literary-minded boy. I think the traditional editor is largely founded on these happy dreams of scribbling youth, sucking the midnight fountain pen, and writing with that flattering ease indistinguishable by night from inspiration. It is natural that youthful writers should conceive that editors are on the side of the literary angels. If my blank was tragedy is good, young Asphodel says to himself, the editor of the Chimes will be glad to print it in his paper and give me golden sovereigns to buy roses for Phyllis. The cynic, being the man who knows, would deal harshly with poor Asphodel's dream. He would point out that the least judicious assistant would not allow the tragedy to reach the editor, that even if it did, the editor would not know whether it was good or bad, that even if, personally, he thought it was good, he would not dare to print it, and though this is beside the case, that Phyllis would prefer to receive jewellery or chocolates. Fortunately, the knowledge is hidden from Masvidal. He writes his tragedy for the waste-paper basket, and doubtless learns something in the writing of it. A philosopher might deduce something of the novelist's soul from the fact that, saving of the photographs of the modern realistic school, the average editor in fiction is not unlike the ideal person from whom young Asphodel twangs his ambitious lyre. Nothing can be more touching than the amount of attention these gentlemen give to the heroine when she takes to the story writing in order to keep her younger sister in Girton. Instead of rejecting her with printed slips of clammy coldness, they give her encouragement, good advice, and crisp five-pound notes with a lavishness that real editors would do well to imitate. I notice that these fictional editors are always curiously susceptible to the charms of young women in distress, but perhaps it would be tactless to inquire whether this pleasant editorial trait has any foundation in fact. I have never met a heroine in real life who has sought assistance from editors by breathing on their grizzled heads, but it is possible that these things are done. I do know a boy of eleven who sent a short story to a well-known London daily paper and received in reply a three-page letter of kindly criticism in the authentic handwriting of the editor. But if I had found this incident in a novel, I would have thought it improbable. I have said above that in all essentials modern editors resemble the ordinary man, and it is only going a step further to assert, with due difference to our common need of mysteries, that editors do not exist at all. There was a time when the personality of the editor dominated the paper he edited. Today, the newspaper seems to eliminate the man. Very few people could name the editors of newspapers to which they are regular subscribers, and fewer still, perhaps, would notice any alteration in a newspaper if the editor were changed. It must be admitted that the state of things is rarely the fault of the editor. Normally a tyrant, he is in truth the slave of many masters. 
his proprietors, the advertisers on whose favor the continuance of the paper depends, the conservatism that drives the oldest readers of a paper to passionate rebuke if the paper shows any signs of change. All these are forces to be reckoned with and obeyed. Then the English law of libel frequently demands not merely a suppression of the truth, but a downright affirmation of falsehood. Against these powers the strongest personality can make but a feeble struggle. Newspapers ought really to die as soon as they have accumulated traditions to check their growth. Failing this, you can trace the passage of an editor down Fleet Street by the clanking of the fetters. Years ago, perhaps, he wrote lyrics more passionate than Swinburne's, more lucid than those of the Restoration singers. Today, he can only consider the pretentious doggerel that passes for verse at general elections. A power in the land he dare not give his honest opinion on any mortal or immortal subject, if that opinion is in any way opposed to the opinion of his readers. His very position deprives him of the right of free speech. The decay of the press began in England, when journals first endeavored to give their readers what they wanted rather than what they lacked. The editor automatically became the servant of the public, where before he had been the public's master. Pills and soap and publishers, broad school intolerance and academic priggishness, fraudulent politics, the foulsome obedience to the common sense that is common without being sense. These are the forces that dictate the policy of the most successful modern newspapers. The average man is a fool. To be pardoned in this world and crowned in the next, because he does not realize his folly. But, by degrees, he has been permitted to bring his nearly all his periodical literature within the range of his empty mind. He expects his daily newspaper to support his own wavering opinions, and if one newspaper is recalcitrant, he spends his copper on another. This man with a penny or two pence a day to spend in literature that shall start no disturbing echo in the vacant corridors of his mind is the virtual editor of half the papers in England. The power of the press, of which we hear so much, is little more than the lackey's power to wheedle a coin or two from his master by the dint of flattering obedience. And the people have come to demand both the flattery and the obedience as a right. The perfect editor would edit the perfect newspaper because he would insist on making of it what he wished, and I think it would be a feature of his perfection that he would allow his contributors to write what they pleased. He would collect individualities as a boy collects postage stamps, and having collected them, he would appreciate their varied color and design, and would not endeavor to mount them into a worthless, meaningless lump. He would not go out of his way to either please or displease possible advertisers. He would neither flatter nor abuse great men. And, lastly, I have written this article in vain if it is not apparent that I think this most important of all. The perfect editor would not care one proverbial damn about his readers. End of section 18「Section 19 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monologues by Richard Middleton. The Revolt of the Philistines. I do not know whether it has ever occurred to the reader, who possesses no doubt carefully cultured tastes in literature and art, to sympathize with the point of view of the man or woman who has not this supreme advantage. I use the word sympathize advisedly, for it is impossible to regard the individual who has failed to explore the finest country of the kingdom he inherits as anything but unfortunate. I would not call him wrong with the intellectual snobs and still less would I call him right in the genial spirit of comradeship that seems to inspire a certain section of the democratic press. I cannot help regarding him in much the same way as I regard a man born blind, 
who has never had the privilege of seeing flowers or the faces of pretty girls and not having seen them is quite incapable of realizing what he lacks there is however a distinction between the two cases for whereas our blind man cannot see at all even the most ignorant people have rudimentary eyes for art and it may be admitted that they derive almost as much enjoyment from the crude pictures and books that they can understand as a person of culture derives from the last word and expression of some great artist it may be said that the appeal of certain kinds of bad art to the uncultured is purely emotional but i have known sound critics of literature who were willing to confess that their judgment of a book is largely influenced by the effect it produced on their emotions though of course their intellect had trained their emotions to require subtler food than that which brightens the eyes of maidservants and sends factory girls singing to their work for the human being who has learnt to appreciate good art bad art becomes impossible and even painful but bad art is more than sufficient to allay the aesthetic cravings of the large majority of people and they therefore not unnaturally regard fine pictures and books as being meaningless pretentious and frequently ludicrous and they further consider that the persons who profess to appreciate such pictures and books are humbugs of the most irritating character who are secretly amusing themselves at their expense it is necessary to understand this attitude of mind of the average philistine because to it is due that bitter spirit of intolerance directed against the beautiful as the aesthetically educated minority conceives it the average mind is not soured because it cannot find any beauty in keats or shelley it is angry that anyone should pretend there is any beauty there to find and really this is a very natural attitude for the average mind to adopt in asking a man to mistrust the evidence of his own senses as to what is or is not beautiful you are asking him to admit that his individuality to which he clings as his only birthright is a possession of no particular value at all i repeat then that it is not unnatural that he should prefer to think that his own judgments are to be relied on and that the superior person who abuses the art he loves and seeks to set up incomprehensible standards is an aesthetic charlatan with these facts in view the most ardent admirer of robert browning's red cotton nightcap country should hesitate to condemn the philistine merely because he is intolerant and a little apt to snigger in his beard when the name of browning is mentioned nor though i have often heard it pleaded against him can the aggressiveness be said to be wholly on the side of the armies of Ascalon? We spend his money on pictures which he finds absurd. We fill his streets with architecture which he considers hideously ugly. And we call him a fool early and late because he will not buy and read books which he cannot understand or support a national drama that he considers barren and unnecessary. What can he do in revenge? Once upon a time he could deride our long hair and our sunflowers and condemn our laxity of morals, but today we dress as he does and conceal our little weaknesses under a similar disguise. We have a dozen periodicals, a dozen societies in which we can get up and abuse his ignorance to our heart's content. But there is not a newspaper in the country, no, not even now, in which an honest admirer of Mr. W. J. Eaton author of The Fireman's Wedding and many other broadsheet ballads, can say that Wadsworth was a babbler and Byron a nasty-minded aristocrat, and that people who profess to admire them are in urgent need of further education. You and I, dear reader, from the heights of our superiority, can score off the Philistine as often as we wish. How can the Philistine get his own back? Taking everything into consideration, I am only astonished that the Philistine should be so tractable as he is. It must be remembered that he is in a sweeping majority in the land, and that this is an age very much inclined to meet the demands of majorities halfway. Yet with the possible exception of certain newspapers circulating entirely in Philistia, which, while they decline to share his attitude of mind, are willing to call him a very fine fellow for his halfpence, 
the position of the aesthetic aristocracy is stronger than ever. There is no question here of yielding to the rights of the democracy. Rather, it is coming more and more to be a canon of criticism that there must be something wrong with a work of art that has a wide popular appeal. Hitherto, it must be presumed that the general lack of interest in art of any kind has saved this tyranny from meeting the normal fate of all tyrannies. But there are not wanting signs that this popular indifference is coming to an end. Two or three generations of a knowledge of the arts of reading and writing and the steadily rising level of the education that is provided for anyone who wants it is bound to make a difference sooner or later. And then... Will the Philistines rebel against the authority of the few? Will they claim the right to elect great artists for themselves and to crown with immortal laurels those who have given them pleasure and satisfied their sense of the beautiful? The mind shrinks at the thought of the reconstruction of museums and picture galleries that their revolt would bring about. Chromolithographs would deck the walls of the National Gallery and the Royal Academy would be devoted to the talents of the pavement artists unless he be, as I sometimes suspect, a product of decadent aestheticism. On the newspapers, the new movement could hardly fail to react, and the working man's epithet would incarnadine all their leading articles. It would be perhaps too wild a flight of fancy to imagine that even these events would induce the publishers to depart from the traditional conservatism of their trade. And doubtless, as now, they would continue in a dignified manner to publish books that no sane man could be expected to read. But in all other centers of artistic activity, there would be chaos, and it is hard to say where the movement would stop. It is impossible to dissociate the idea of revolution from that of bloodshed, and if the small group of critics and artists refused to revoke their former dogmatic judgments, the revolt of the Philistines might prove to be serious indeed. As in a dream, not wholly deprived of splendor, I can see Bedford Park going up to heaven in a shape of flame, and Chelsea riven to its artistic heart by the fire and hazard of war. I can see critics shot down in the streets like dogs, and the bodies of poets swinging from the lampposts of Westminster. The air would be bitter with the smoke of burning books, and the feet of the mentally poor would spring buoyantly from the pavements, released from the intolerable load we have laid upon them since they were born. In broad daylight, grown men would praise the Albert Memorial and call it lovely, and women would chant the ballads of Mr. G. R. Sims without shame for the ignorance of their sex. Wherever a man might go, he would see men and women writing their autobiographies, free at last to express the miraculous spirit of their lives without fear of the critics and their iron laws. Like paupers splitting firewood, so would they split infinities with a light pen and a merry heart for the wonder of the things they had to tell their fellows. All men would be painters, critics, poets, architects. In a word, all men would be artists. Here and there, perhaps, in a quiet corner, one or two of us would mourn our lost aristocracy. But all around us would surge the triumphant people, let loose in a world the like of which they had not known, joined in a universal brotherhood of bad art. This, if you will, is a fantastic speculation, but there is, I think, an element of truth in it. Today the majorities win, and it is not unlikely that sooner or later the majority will triumph over the critics in matters of art, and that the unfixed standards of beauty will be lowered to meet the tastes of the half-cultured and the half-educated. And the only melancholy satisfaction to be derived from the foreboding is that we can do nothing to prevent its being fulfilled. There is no stopping majorities when they are out for blood, and sooner or later they will realize the importance of art and sweep us off the face of the earth. The only miracle is that the Philistines have endured the browbeating of aesthetic critics so long. End of section 19. Recorded by Bob Hamilton. Section 20 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.
for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by eva davis monologues by richard middleton the virtues of getting drunk one of the disadvantages in writing in the language of a puritan people is that before you argue about a problem at all you are expected to consider it from the standpoint of conventional morality but as a matter of fact our moralities are dogmatic which means that they are either above or below argument thus the many excellent persons who are of the opinion that drunkenness is in itself a sin apart from its effect on the individual or the race are obviously not prepared to argue about drunkenness at all and i should be the last to condemn the comfortable convention that absolves a man from all intellectual effort and responsibility in judging between right and wrong but there are i imagine a great many people whose consciences will not allow their judgment to sleep with the placid generalizations of their forefathers and for these the art of getting drunk must be examined in all its aspects before it can be condemned broadly speaking even the unmoral have agreed to regard drunkenness as foolish but the consuming of alcoholic beverages which can only be regarded as the process by which a man becomes drunk has many eloquent admirers and supporters this i know is a favorite argument of those passionate fanatics so humorously labeled with the word temperance who hold that a man who drinks a glass of beer is a glass of beer nearer intoxication and nothing more the normal answer to these raucous moralists is that a man who eats a muffin is not really in any greater danger of perishing of a surfeit of muffins than he was before he consumed it but in arguing it is the divine right of the individual to crown what argument he pleases with his approval and i confess that this method of regarding every one who eats a liqueur chocolate as a potential drunkard appeals to my fancy and satisfies my reason apart from the moral aspect it is necessary to consider the effect of getting drunk on the mind and body of the individual and also in so far as it affects his welfare the effect his getting drunk has on the community at large now so far as the former part of the problem is concerned i notice a curious thing like everyone else who abuses his noble gift of sight by reading newspapers i have read an extraordinary mass of condemnation of drunkenness from the pens of doctors sociologists clergymen reformed drunkards and other interested persons but i do not recollect coming across one respectable argument against a man occasionally getting drunk to get drunk is to consume alcohol to excess and all the statistics and diatribes i have discovered have been directed against excess of this excess rather than against the excess in itself of course i know that there is a widely accepted theory that drinking begets drinking but except in the case of persons with a natural tendency to intemperance i do not believe that this theory has any foundation in fact while the yet wilder theory that drunkenness begets drunkenness that a man who has once had too much to drink is thereby encouraged to drink to excess again is when we remember the extreme physical discomforts with which nature rebukes excess altogether beyond belief of any reasonable person as a matter of fact the average consumer of alcoholic beverages never gets drunk if only for fear of the bodily pains that state induces and my mistrust of compromise in general would lead me to suspect that this timidity is a vice rather than a virtue that he is likely reaping the varied ills that we are told are the necessary consequences of the consumption of alcohol without enjoying the undoubted benefits that accrue from coming to grips now and then with the laws that control his life just as a child who has sobbed its way back to penitence on its mother's lap feels wiser and happier than it did before it committed its little fault so the child man is apt to win a greater love and a fuller knowledge of his mother nature often she has punished him with her frowns and dried his tears with her sunshine after all 
we are no more than little children on a big scale we are not afraid of dark rooms but we are afraid of the darkness of the heavens we do not run from our own shadows but we stand panic-stricken within the shadows of our own hearts and the analogy may be trusted further in a nursery it is always the best child that gets into all the scrapes it has inherited its due share of naughtiness and it is not cunning enough to keep its transgressions within the vague limits of the law and we may trace the way of the simple sinners through life readily enough a drunken man walks down the street and the hypocrites lean from the windows of their houses and rend the skies with their clamorous disgust it is always pretty safe to trust a man who wears his vices on his sleeve but i fear that i have strayed a little from my argument i hold no brief for drunkenness but i do think that it is a good thing that a man should occasionally very occasionally if you wish drink too much in the first place this does not leave him like many of the less concrete vices uncertain as to or even ignorant of his transgression and a realization of his own frailties keeps a man modest and companionable the greatest fault of teetotalers as far as i have examined these dreary propagandists is not that they are too consciously proud of their sobriety in the face of a total absence of temptation but that they affect to be wholly free from all those weaknesses that knit individuals made in the image of god into a human world yet it is difficult not to believe that drunkenness which reaps so violent and immediate a punishment is not a lesser vice than those defects of meanness and hypocrisy that a man may nurture unpunished in his heart self-respect is a quality so near akin to self-righteousness that in preserving the one we are always in danger of breeding the other a talisman by aid of which a man may remain tolerant is cheaply purchased at the price of an occasional headache but i am willing to go further and say that i believe that an occasional excess in his cups is good for a man's mind and body as well as for his heart any one who uses his mind in his work though i fear that this is an argument that only appeals to the minority will have suffered from time to time from an attack of staleness if he be a member of parliament he will find himself at a loss for a method by which to reform the house of lords if he be a writer of little articles he will find that all the little articles have already been written by someone else if he be a poet the music of the universe will sound in his ears like the thin voice of a barrel organ heard from afar at such a time to betake oneself to the wine bowl in fitting company is to win after the lapse of a day be it said a new brain it is though some friendly hand had stirred up the stagnant mind with a stick and brought the ideas to the surface like bubbles and there is a parallel state of bodily staleness for which the doctors prescribe a change of air that can frequently be cured in the same simple fashion it seems as though nature likes obedience but neither demands nor desires servility from her children a day of hot coppers suffered in a mood of patient humility sends a man back to his work in the glad spirit of a dew-drunk butterfly i do not believe in making a habit of inebriation any more than i believe in making a habit of doing anything either good or bad to be efficacious a remedy of this kind must be used cautiously and only when the occasion demands it the man who is perpetually drunk is no better off than the man who is perpetually sober and believers in wilde's epigram should remember that excess ceases to be successful when it becomes normal it is difficult as montaigne found in considering a rather similar problem to lay down a definite rule of conduct in a matter of this kind but i should think that man very unfortunate who found it necessary to get drunk more than twice in a year 
it is possible that after a certain period in a man's life when he has sinned too often to nourish any further belief in his infallibility and when his mind is no longer capable of giving him surprises it is not necessary for him to get drunk at all end of section twenty section twenty one of monologues this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org monologues by richard middleton the verdict of posterity it is very common for critics and other individuals who take an interest in contemporary art to indulge in speculations as to how far certain manifestations of that art which appeals to them perhaps in spite of their better judgment possess the quality of durability after mr kipling's cloven-hoofed critic has examined a work admitted its prettiness and expressed a doubt as to whether it is art there follows very closely the gentleman who says oh yes it seems to be art but will it live and of the two he is the harder to argue with in the first place it is very difficult to say what constitutes life in terms of works of art and it may reasonably be doubted whether any artist's effort at expression lives in the sense in which we use the word in discussing the claims of a contemporary artist whom we do not like what we can say is that some time after publication some books are read more than others and that many cease to be read at all that it is not necessarily the works of art that preserve the widest audience that secure the greatest measure of general esteem though this may sound paradoxical and that many of our so-called english classics linger chiefly in the pages of literary histories and are rarely read save by experts when we leave art and consider the attributes of human fame in general we are bound to admit that for the majority of living human beings the dead have little interest or significance we adopt or rather perhaps adapt their ideas we take advantage of their discoveries we take up the task of existence where they laid it down but for the rest we say like titlow in the blue bird that there are no dead though our motive is different we accept the theory that a live dog is better than a dead lion with wholehearted enthusiasm and the idiot who gibbers in the cell of an asylum is infinitely more alive to us than shakespeare perhaps subconsciously we despise the dead because they have not been clever enough to go on living no we will not allow the ghosts the smallest fraction of the life that boils in our veins and makes us commit crimes and heroic actions yet looking ahead to that inconceivable age when we ourselves shall be no more we display a childish eagerness as to the ultimate fate of our individual personalities whether we are criminals or heroes we wish the age to come to be aware of our identities and it is possible to conclude from the lives of many of our great men that they would rather be remembered for their follies than forgotten altogether yet the man who sacrifices part of his life for posthumous fame should reflect that only a small percentage of men and women have any regard for the past and that the remainder will avail themselves of whatever they may find useful in his life's work without giving a thought to the dead man who was responsible for their inheritance nevertheless when we talk of a work of art living we mean that it still retains its individual appeal to a limited audience and in attempting an estimate of what will survive of contemporary literature in a hundred years time we must take into consideration the lines along which the cultured class is likely to develop and here i may remark that in spite of the spread of scholastic education it does not seem likely to me that the cultured class of the future will be any greater in numbers than it is now it is true that nowadays we teach everyone how to read but at the same time we take care to teach them that the habit of reading is unfortunate from the point of view of their material welfare i should like to look forward to a golden age when every one should read good books but i cannot even feel confident that the time will come when every one will talk about them i foresee that the cultured class of the future surrounded on all sides by individuals who are uncultured from choice and not from necessity 
will tend to become more precious and more priggish than ever the gap between journalism which caters for the many and literature which can only appeal to the fit few will widen and persons who really take an interest in english literature will be regarded rather in the light in which students of anglo-saxon are marveled at now it should be possible to deduce what contemporary works this cultured minority will find worth the reading from the kind of literature that is worn down from the past to our own day with some elements of life lingering between the battered boards the difficulty here is to distinguish between the books that still command a genuine if strictly limited public and those that really only survive as historical documents for the student of literature the recent flood of cheap reprints gave us numerous editions of books of both classes but how far these books were bought to read and how far they were bought as a convenient substitute for valentines and christmas cards not even the publishers who sold them can say this and the habit of giving books as presents and prizes render the circulation test unreliable when applied to the classics how many people read spencer today he is it seems one of the great immortals but is he read by any one outside what we may call the professional class of book reader that is poets essayists letter writers in search of tags and mr john burns does any one read ben johnson does any one to come nearer to our day does any one here read shelley these are questions to which it is impossible to obtain a definite answer but i can only say that if there is a large number of persons outside literary circles who read the english classics they keep very quiet about their amiable hobby i have sometimes thought in moments of depression that we who write get our living solely by taking in each other's scribblings i am willing to allow that the state of mind of a man who can read the works of others without wishing to write himself is incomprehensible to me and it is possible that he does not exist this doubt as to the nature of the circle that the classics still enchant renders argument by analogy a little difficult when we come to consider the work of contemporary writers from the point of view of posterity but one or two theories may be safely advanced work that depends for its merit rather on the novelty of its theme and the freshness of its arguments than on the perfection of its expression is bound to perish as soon as the public mind has assimilated the new ideas such work puts forth this rules out at one stroke practically the whole of the work done by the more prominent writers of this very didactic age i cannot see to take a striking instance what will induce posterity to read the plays of mr bernard shaw but a section of our modern drama may survive as presenting a truthful picture of the life of to-day while as in the case of gulliver's travels the didactic significance is overlooked or forgotten justice to take a very up-to-date instance may well render such a service to posterity as the shoemaker's holiday and bartholomew fair have rendered to us in restoring the atmosphere of a vanished age again i think it is important that the artist's style should possess that simplicity that appeals to all ages alike it is possible for an intelligent person to read chaucer without a glossary to-day will it be possible for anyone to read mr rudyard kipling with equal ease in the year twenty two hundred chaucer while sinning freely in his passion for gallicisms relied for the most part on simple words and simple terms of speech mr kipling has such an affection for the ephemeral dialects of the hour that his early short stories already betray their age there is a danger too in the direct appeal to sentiment for the sentiment of one generation is the sentimentality of the more sophisticated generation that succeeds it mr barry's little thrums papers that were so good when they first appeared have hardly escaped the effects of this disastrous metamorphosis where are we to find our present-day writers of distinction who are not didactic who are not sentimental and who write clear and expressive english i have made a list of five and i think that the reader must be happily catholic if he can make a longer list for himself and if we leave the realms of literary art it would i think be even harder to find a number of men likely to achieve even that transitory fame that man grants grudgingly to the mighty dead i can think of two painters but i cannot think of one politician who will seem more than a shadow to those that come after 
Perhaps, like the majority of our countrymen, the age to come will esteem professional cricket and football above art, and we may not make so bad a showing after all. The thought is consoling to our national vanity, even if we do not go so far as to hope that the possibility may be fulfilled. End of section 21「Section 22 of Monologues」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. K. Edison, New Jersey. Monologues by Richard Middleton Is England Decadent? While, on the whole, finding party politics a little insincere, and inclined to sympathize with the oblivious state of mind that readily forgets general elections, I think it would be rather a pity if the message of one election in particular was allowed to pass unregarded. This message, as our partisan newspapers acknowledged a little ruefully, was of a wholly negative character. The people of England did and did not believe in the House of Lords. They liked and did not like the budget, they appreciated and did not appreciate free trade, or tariff reform, as it is sometimes called. In a word, speaking by means of a record poll, the people of England said nothing to which any reasonable man could attach any reasonable meaning. Our professional politicians shouted lustily into the abyss, and waited in vain for the sound of an echo. It is only fair to add, since politicians are much maligned, that both parties detected the inspiriting voice of victory in this embarrassing silence. But in face of the irreconcilable natures of their respective claims, it seems juster to presume that both parties were defeated, and this, to the discriminating student of men and voters, seemed the most natural result of the recent election. It may be true of all elections, it was certainly true of this one, that the man in the street, indistinguishable in these democratic days from the god in the car, votes in accordance with the decrees of his own prejudices rather than from any strong feeling on the general issues of the election. A candidate with a queer-sounding name loses votes, just as a candidate who is the son of a peer gains them. Owing to the varying degrees of intelligence possessed by voters, this system of voting produces chaos. Thus, in the election under notice, many men voted for the government because the publicans had raised the price of whiskey, while many men voted for the opposition for the very same reason. It was unreasonable to expect a definite opinion of the budget from a country thus distraught, nor indeed did we get it. I imagine that patriotism, using the word in any but its parish pump significance, is the rarest of all human enthusiasms. It demands the possession on the part of the individual of two qualities, altruism and imagination, which are sufficiently rare by themselves, but quite exceptional in partnership. It is, I think, fairly obvious that it is an imagination that present-day Englishmen are lacking. They have not the art, to use a homely phrase, of seeing beyond the noses, and they demand that all their sacrifices should be of immediate and obvious benefit to their neighbours. It is perhaps a hard saying, but I am sure that the mere idea of making sacrifices for the country strikes the average Englishman as savouring of cant. How far this may be due to our growing materialism, I do not know. In the golden age of Elizabeth, England seems to have bred fine imaginations with the greatest ease. Her sons were not merely imaginative in word, but also in deed, as the stories of her ancient poets can testify. But nowadays there is something essentially un-English in concerning oneself with national abstractions to the detriment of one's own business. According to the labels which we have elected to attach to our individual prejudices, the word patriotism is unpleasantly suggestive either of Jews, mafficking and cheap Union Jacks, or of disloyal Celts and bomb-throwing niggers. The invention of local patriotism, that rascally phrase to salve the consciences of the unpatriotic, has proved but a step to the general adoption of self-patriotism. The modern Englishman is the deafest and blindest kind of individualist. Any idea that lies outside his own mental environment strikes him as fanciful and ridiculous. 
the country in which he lives is inhabited only by his friends and connections and his sole duty is to guard their interests sometimes he has a snobbish esteem for the masters of richer countries than his sometimes he indulges in sentimental pity for those who starve at his frontiers masters of no country at all but normally he makes his house not merely his castle but his kingdom his empire and his ultimate heaven as well england as an ideal to be served and cherished no longer exists for him at all the decay of the patriotic ideal is serious enough in itself but it becomes even more significant if you regard it merely as one particular manifestation of a general decay the present-day englishman is afraid of the big thought the big emotion the big love the big thought is pretentious the big emotion is bestial the big love is affected so with a shrinking phrase and a cackling laugh he tries to veil his covered soul from anything too great to be comfortable to its infinite smallness generation on generation of unchecked prosperity has robbed him of humility the virtue that is a bond of fellowship between the nobly little and the nobly great he has come to believe that he has not only inherited the earth but created it or at all events so far improved on its original design that all the credit is his by right and he feels that the criticism implied in the existence on his earth of greater forces than himself is irreverent seated on the throne that he has raised he is quite satisfied with the order of the incense that he himself has lighted and the winds that blow through the temple doors and disturb the calm ascent of the admiring smoke are very distasteful to him within his breast the anger of an outraged god and the sorrow of an interrupted worshipper strive for mastery which means that he meets criticism with a lofty air of unconcern not the less insolent that it is assumed time was when the english were the most arrogant people in the world because they lived in england today england is the most arrogant country in the world because it is inhabited by the english then we were proud of our manly virtues now we are proud of our freedom from the manly vices without asking what that freedom signifies it is a pleasure to set an example to the civilized world yet as a nation we are not united even in sanctimoniousness every individual wishes to force the majority to accept his own standard of bigotry we are however more or less agreed in condemning the manner of life of the other european nations and it is not a fault that they regard us as hypocritical yahoos and hold saint john bull himself to be no more than an inflated frog by no means emancipated from the ancestral slime being a journalist i may be inclined to attach too much importance to the press as representing the public mind of the hour but so far as it is possible for one man to study a nation i am convinced that england has the press it deserves in itself this is natural for the whole policy of present-day newspaper proprietors is to turn out a paper that will please its readers rather than inform or influence them in consequence from the pert frivolity of punch to the teutonic and stodgy erudition of the athenaeum the earnest student of periodical literature will find that a constant effort is being made to treat the abstract in terms of the concrete to measure the infinite from a fixed and belittling point of view politics are party politics religion is a clash of rival creeds love is a compromise between the divorce court and the agony column death is an obituary notice five letters long literature is bad journalism art is bad morality and it might be added a newspaper is an advertisement sheet containing certain other matters it is only necessary to compare this with the view for instance held by the man in the street on the subject of different nationalities to realize how exact a judgment the newspapers have formed of the popular mind the french are immoral the germans eat sausages the italians play barrel organs the japanese use fans spaniards visit bullfights and russians are anarchists thus with one pregnant fact the democratic critic is able to distinguish between foreigners or aliens as they are called if they are unfortunate enough to have no money i doubt whether the english were ever broad-minded as a nation indeed the elizabethan comedies and the narratives of early voyagers breathe as full a spirit of intolerance as the most ardent patriot could desire 
but this older intolerance was very definitely national. That is to say, it represented the prejudices of the nation rather than those of individuals, and from one point of view this spirit was to be commended. But today we can only judge the temper of the nation by striking an average between the loud-mouth condemnations of a thousand factions. The newspapers, which might help, are swayed hither and thither by the clamour of individuals. When the voice of the nation is asked for a judgment, we hear the babble of a million tongues. I remember reading somewhere, as a sign of a national decadence, that whereas in our brave days we were proud of being so small an island, we now sought the favour of the gods by bragging of the immensity of our empire, and perhaps the criticism contains a hint of the causes of our present weakness. That we are strangely weak, no man who has considered our attitude towards Germany can deny. While cultivating our individual conceit, we have lost the happy faith in ourselves that helped our forefathers to do impossible things. We have no national religion, no national art, no national songs. We have not the power to act nobly, so we brand as fanatics the few who seek to conquer themselves. We have not the power to think nobly, so we scoff at noble things. During the last appeal in question to the nation, the whole of the arguments of the politicians were directed to individuals, and it was as individuals that we replied. England, it might be said, no longer exists. We must draw what consolation we may from the fact that it has been conquered by Englishmen. End of section 22. Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey. Section 23 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey. Monologues by Richard Middleton. Uncomfortable Spring Spring is here again, and the observant will doubtless have noticed shy almond blossoms gleaming in the front gardens of suburban villas above the tufts of crocuses. Now the many-mooded weeks begin to grant us tremulous blue days, tender and soft as the petal of a flower, one here and one there, in magnificent promise of the azure summer that we shall not get. The flower girls delight the streets with fragrant heralds from the Channel Islands. Tailors talk glibly of the new spring patterns that are exactly like the old. Women feel a strange longing to impale the dead bodies of new birds with their hatpins in honour of the season. The democracy cleans its bicycle and schemes improbable holidays, and the hibernation of county cricketers draws to its welcome close. There is a general tendency on the part of writers, and possibly of most individuals, to describe spring as being a very joyous season for poor humanity. Doubtless it was joyous enough in primitive days, when we lived in caves and went to nature direct for our table d'hote. But in a state of civilization, we are unwilling to be reminded of the primitive element in our natures. As far as possible, we have abolished the seasons. The long nights that must have been singularly monotonous to our hairy ancestors are no more. Indeed, for the privilege of living a few hours by artificial light, we spend an appreciable fraction of the daylight in bed. We skate in summer and eat strawberries in winter. We have flowers all the year round, and we do not associate the breaking of the buds on the trees with warmth and overeating. Even the traditional custom of making love in the spring is, I fancy, Pacey Tennyson going out of fashion. Spring, the birth of the new green year, has lost its old significance of good times come again. Children are often, oddly, more civilized than grown-up people, and it is they who show the greatest resentment of the perturbing effects of spring, so that at this season of the year the wise ruler of children does not fail to lay in a supply of tonics, those nauseating compounds that are supposed to reconcile young people with life. But though adult grievances against nature's recurrent frivolity are not so easily cured, they are by no means less genuine. It may be that, during the long winter months, we have cut and polished our latest philosophy of life to a fine perfection, yet a careless spray of almond blossom and a wind like good burgundy will undo our work in a trice and all is to be done again. 
it seems as though a man may by no means contrive to pass peaceably from his cradle to his grave borne on the placid wings of a fixed idea the spring has a rough way with our philosophies though a civilized man without a philosophy is a forlorn and disillusioned creature painful to the eyes of the cultured elect to the convenient dogmas of civilization the spring affixes an impudent note of interrogation it wakes strange doubts of authority in our minds in the spirit of the schoolboy whose idle fingers elongate the nose of a schoolmaster caricatured on his blotting paper we begin to feel rebellious against the conventional virtues that have been as iron laws through the winter we question work and obedience and sobriety our eyes rigid moralists at other seasons detect the shapely angles of women with a certain glee we strut a little in our walks abroad and clutch eagerly at feather-brained excuses for neglecting a business our quickened blood reproaches all our decent rules of life as so many spoilers of sport we dream as far as our lack of practice in that exercise will permit us the wind which blows across the mountains has made us mad and yet we are not happy at this time of year and the reason is by no means difficult to discover during the calmer months we are content to live the life that civilization demands of us ignoring the mischievous suggestions of our emotions and even our intellects but when april comes and encouraging us to doubt the wisdom of our voluntary fetters deprives us of that solemn vanity which guards us normally from the consequences of our humanity we are like rudderless ships cast half aside on to the disordered sea of life in december we can look at pretty girls with a proper reticence of eye and thought for we know that the moralities of our neighbors are all about us but in april or may we do not care a primrose for our neighbors or their moralities our eyes sparkle our lips taste the breath of life our feet tap tunes on the pavement and in our hearts we say good heavens how pretty the girls are this year this would be well enough in its way if we were accustomed to dealing with such braggart and swashbuckler thoughts and knew how to keep them under a generous but firm control but in the placid seasons of the year that civilization has made its own we do not think at all since wise men have thought for us already and we only permit ourselves such emotions as the experience of others has shown us to be safe rebel spring will have none of our cautious conventions and his foaming splendors act on our minds like strong ale on the guarded bodies of total abstainers we are all poets in the spring but unlike those who dwell all the year round on the slopes of olympus we do not know where we are we call our mother nature ma with the unblushing confidence of commercial travelers and are genuinely puzzled when she scratches her faces in a tempest of indignation even the narcissus according to certain scientists can give us influenza or at the least hay fever and in our newfound enthusiasm for emotional adventure we shall be lucky if we escape so lightly what will they say in hampstead if we take to reading the yellow book because the daffodil has more courage than our sister the swallow i suppose it was my subconscious realization of the perils of spring that led me recently to fly to the friendly shelter of those surrey pine woods that won me as a child and hold the better part of me captive still the man who has never made friends with a pine forest does not know what a forest can be my own especial woods have the moving dignity of a vast cathedral the cool dimness of untrodden aisles stretching between tapering columns while here and there as it were through stained glass a brittle sunbeam falls to break into a thousand glittering fragments on the smooth roughness of the pine needles the birds are the best of choristers while numberless insects droning in the heather of the clearings imitate closely enough the devout murmur of a distant congregation moreover to help my peace there are no creatures of the female sex in these far solitudes save for a few small pinafored atoms who gather fuel in silence suffering the majesty of the pines to hush the shrill loquacity of their youth 
in a world of feminine changeableness it is an agreeable quality in pine woods to be very much the same at any season of the year they assume no sordid poverty in winter no arrogant hopefulness in spring an oak forest has a thousand moods to perplex the heart of man the pines have but one mood and that a mood of noble and enviable serenity i never get between the pines but i smell the sussex air sang mr hilaire belloc before westminster took him wholly and in the same way the pines speak eloquently to me of that fairest part of england where surrey meets hampshire black lake waverley sandy lane lower burn the very names are like songs to me there is an inn that some of my readers may know that has a name like a poem and draught beer like an anthology and the pride of the valley with its proprietary fish pools and its maternal solicitude for the welfare of the devil's jumps is all that the most ambitious valley could desire but all this is perhaps a little remote from the spring save that i hold that that man is wise who realizes the dangers of the springtime season and betakes himself to some quiet place where he can contemplate the face of nature melting into her new laughters without fear of being compromised by that element of primitive man that still survives within him and is apt to give such violent manifestations of its existence when the buds are breaking on the trees this is a season when stockbrokers marry their typewriting girls and the younger sons of hereditary legislators go every night to the gaiety theatre with a saturday matinee thrown in this is a season or so the novels tell me when grey-haired editors pinch the cheeks of their beautiful poetesses and when the poor young man who has loved us faithfully all the winter proves to be the duke of southminster the richest and most interesting of all the backward peers to the foolish romantic incident of this character may seem harmless or even desirable but to the majority that has realized the soundness of the lines on which civilization has decreed that the world should run spring with its eccentricities must remain an inconvenient and distressing season end of section twenty three recording by s k edison new jersey